Good evening and welcome. This is our Wednesday evening prayer meeting and the, this evening we would like to look at Israel and what is happening in Gaza and the responses that are being made by different countries and look at the history of Israel itself. Now, we learned today that the nations are coming together to recognize a Palestinian state. We see that Ireland, Norway, Spain, and others are coming together to recognize a Palestinian state. Now, with that in mind, it drives us back to the word of Yah. And I would just like to remind you this evening of Leviticus chapter 25, 23 and 24. The word says, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the land of your possession we shall grant a redemption for the land. That's what he has said, the land is his and it must not be sold. The implication there, it ought not to be cut up and that part given to one nation and the other part given to another nation. We read also in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8, that when the most I divided the nation, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So even at that early stage of the inheritance being given to the nation, Yah had in mind Israel as a people. And as usual, when I speak of Israel, I am not talking of geographical Israel. I'm speaking of the Israel of Yah that is found in Galatians 6 and verse 16. So, moreover, as we read Deuteronomy chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1, we read, When Yahweh thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Ittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Evites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. He said, When you go in there, drive them out. So we see clear indication here that Yah intend no other nation of people to dwell with the children of Israel, whoever Israel is at that particular point. So we read also in Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5, Thus saith Yah Elohim, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and country that are round about her. He said, I have put Israel in the midst of the nation. You see the same thing recorded in Ezekiel chapter 32, 38, I should say, in verse 12. Take a spoil and take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nation. This is talking about the regathering in, that is spoken about in Isaiah 11 and 11. He said, which have gone cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Again, we see that Israel, like the Garden of Eden, where the tree, that tree in the garden, is placed in the middle. Israel, symbolically, is placed in the middle of the nations. We see that. And we recognize that this Palestinian state now is going to be 
a wide debate, and it has been among the nations of people, because some are for it and some are against it. But in light of all that is happening, I want to go back into the history of Israel and look at what I would call the al kabulan Judaism. al kabulan Judaism. Because I think it's important. It is crucial that we identify who Israel is so that we do not get confused or we don't have to conjecture about the whole thing. So I'm going to ask you to come with me to the book of Chronicles, First Chronicles, and we're going to do the fifth portion of it, reading verse 25 and 26. It says, And they transgressed against the Elohim of their fathers, and went a whoring after the idols of the people and the land whom Elohim destroyed before them. And the Elohim of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tigla Polisa, king of Assyria, and he carried them away, even the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and brought them unto Elah, and Abel, and Ara, and to the river Gozan, unto this day. So, we read here in First Chronicles chapter 5, 25 and 26, it's telling us, when the children of Israel were taken out, and where they were placed. We must understand that. Because at that particular time, the Assyrian Empire was located in the Mesopotamian area of what we now today call Iraq. Because as you remember, Nineveh was the capital of that empire. So, Yah is letting us know that they were taken and they have been there to this day. So the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel began around right about 740 BC under King Paul, as we just read in 1 Chronicles 5.26. So Yahweh it was who stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tegla, Pelesa, king of Assyria, and took them into exile, namely the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now it's important that we understand that these tribes here were those that did not want to cross over the Jordan. They went to Moses and said, listen, we don't want to cross over the Jordan. You know, we want to stay here because the, the land is good for us. And Moses basically said to them, you know, are you going to allow your brethren to fight alone and you don't help them in this conquest? And so they went over. But the land was subsequently given back to them. But they were the ones who were first taken into captivity. And we learn also that run right about 20 years subsequent to that, in 722 BC, um, in the capital city of Samaria, the Assyrians came again and took away the rest of the people. So the whole process started in about 740 BC and the rest of it in 722 BC. And the word tells, well, let's read it for ourselves so we can see what has happened. Turn with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, and we will look at chapter 17. And we will begin round about verse 5. The word says, Then the king of Assyria came up 
throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Oshea, the king of Assyria, took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Allah and Abor by the river Gazon and in the cities of the Medes. Did you get that? So it is in that area, in the Babylon, in the cities of the Medes, where the nation, the nation of the tribes, the northern tribe, were placed. The word says that. So we need to understand what happened and that they were placed there. So we read on in chapter 17 of 2 Kings because it says that in verse 18 that Yah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So all the tribes were taken and no one was in Israel, basically in the northern tribe. Only Judah was left. Now, I'm emphasizing this point because, you know, contrary to what scholars and theologians and politicians have said, the word says, he placed, the Assyrians placed the people, the children of Israel, in the region of Iraq and in the region of the Medes. That's Iran, in that area. That's where they were. And he said, up until this day, meaning that they're still there. So, in verse 24 of the same passage that we just read chapter 17 it says the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Putha and from Ava and from Amath and from Saparvim and placed them in the city of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they possess Samaria and dwell in the cities thereof. Now, understand why this is so important for us to understand. The ten tribes were taken by the Assyrian Empire, the king. And that process that I indicated earlier started in 740 BC, and the last set of people were taken in 722 BC. So imagine the land is now empty. The land is empty of the 10 tribes because they're elsewhere placed and they have not yet returned. So what the king of Assyria did, it says the king took people from other areas. These are aliens. These are not the children of Israel. And they brought them to Samaria in the northern kingdom. And so when we're dealing with people in Samaria and Palestine and indeed Israel today, we need to go back to the word of Yah and see exactly what happened. And I'll read it again for emphasis. It says, and the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Arba and from Amath and from Sephardim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the city thereof. Verse 25, and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not Yahweh, therefore Yah sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, 
the nations which thou hadst removed, and the place in the city of the Samaria, now that the true religion of the Elo Elohim of the land, therefore he had sent lions among them, and behold, they slayed them, because they know not the religion of the Elohim of the land. Did you hear that? It says the people who came from Babylon and elsewhere were not the ones who left. In that regard, they knew not the religion. They knew not the fate of Yah. And so they did not fear Yah. And as a consequence, he sent lions. He sent lions to slay them and to, and to devour them. Verse 27, then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the true religion of Elohim of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwell in Bethel and taught them how they should fear you. Now, if you recall that Jeroboam, we were reading 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam was the man, was the man who put the idol, put a, you know, made a calf and put one in Bethel and one in Dan. And so this priest, I don't know whether this priest was one of Jeroboam's recruit, but he came back to teach the people how to fear you. Uh, the point, though, that need not be missed by any of us is that the people here who were now in the land of Samaria, the northern kingdom, these were not the Israelites. The Israelites had been exiled and they have remained in exile. So I would suspect that by the time we get to John chapter 4 and the woman of Samaria, had come, she may have been a descendant of one of these people. We don't know. The scripture doesn't say that. But if all the children had left, the children of Israel had left, then it is fair to make that summation. It's fair to do that. And so my reason for going all that way is to present you with Isaiah 11 in verse 11. Because Yah says he's going to round up the people that were taken by the Assyrians and at the end time, the now time, return them back home. Now, if he's going to return them, not if he says he will, and Yah's word will not return to him void. It will accomplish that which he said. If he says that, then what do we do with the people who are currently there? Let's look at Isaiah 11 in verse 11. It says, And it shall come to pass in uh, that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again a second time. Because he did it in, e in Egypt. He's going to do it a second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, same people, and from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, that's Iran, just as the scripture said earlier, and from Shinar, that's Babylon, and from Amath, and from the islands of the sea. Now, one doesn't need to have a degree in discernment here. Yah says, these are the areas where I'm going to round up the people that were dispersed in these lands. We see nothing here of any indication or any reference to the nations of Europe. And so we looked at the fact that the the Syrians who took the ten tribes brought them to Babylon and to the cities of the Medes. That's where they placed them. And Yah says, 
He's going there to bring the people back. Therefore, the question emerges. If that's the case, then the people under the Balfour Agreement in 1948 who were taken from the cities and the countries of Europe and brought to Yisrael and have the world saying that these are the children of Israel, we seem to have a contradiction here based on the word of Yah. And therefore, it behooves us to rightly divide the word so that we can understand what is happening in, what is happening in, in the context of the fact that the nations now are coming together to create a two-state country. Two states. They want to see Israel and they want to see the Palestinians unite together. That's the political intent of the modern world. Now, we read earlier that Sephardim, the people came from Sephardim and came to Samaria, meaning they were not indigenous people, Sephardim. And one wonders as we look at the different types of people calling themselves or claiming to be Jew, the Sephardic Jews, whether it is the same set of people, because if it is the same set of people claiming to be Sephardic, the word here is that they were brought in to Samaria and therefore they were not. Now, Having said that, then you may say, okay, let's look at Israel itself. And to look at Israel, we need to go to Genesis chapter 10. This is our Bible study this evening, and we're just looking at what the Word says. Bereshit chapter 10 and verse 3. And the Word says, And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Ritah, and Togama, and the sons of Javan, that's Greece, Greek, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their land. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Now, it is interesting because, as we know, the majority of the people in Israel claiming to be Jews today they are Ashkenazi. And Moses here, who writes in Barashi chapter 10 and verse 3, is letting us know that the Ashkenazi, these are the coastland people, they make up the Gentile. Now, one would find it very difficult not to accept what Moses wrote. Moses took dictation on Mount Sinai from the great I am, Yahweh. And so he wrote it down for our admonition, and this is what we're saying. So here is a question then that might well be looked at in the light of circumstances. So we're saying that the people who came into Samaria, the northern kingdom, these were not indigenous to the land. They were not. The word says that. We read that in chapter 17 of Kings. And we also read in First Chronicles chapter 5, and verse 26, they were not. We now read in Exodus, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 3, that those who now call themselves Jews, they too are not Jews. So, what does that mean for us in our study? And so we must look and try and comprehend a little bit more because we learn that Israel, the general history, provides no indication, I mean contemporary history, no indication of bronze people. 
No. But that is until the 1747 map, world map, British and French cartographers, these are map makers, they charted a map of Africa, of Alkabulan, saying the land of Judah is in Africa. Now, that's interesting, and therefore it, it warrants our attention. So, let me say that again, the cartographers, French and British, came up with a map of Africa, of Alkabulan, and they said the kingdom of Judah is in West Africa. Some scholars being made incredulous by, by that statement, obviously, say that the kingdom of Judah in West Africa bears no resemblance to the kingdom of Judah in Israel. And so we want to rightly divide the word on that. So let's turn to Luke chapter 21, and we will read from about verse 20. He says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by harmonies, this is Yeshua speaking, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, or let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let those who are in the country enter her. So Yeshua gives this warning that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, his reference here is to AD 70. But we know as we studied in the book of Jeremiah that there were many bronze Alkabulans, Hebrew, Yehudi people during that period of time. And the migration from Israel started during that particular time of Jeremiah when the Jews Judah was taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. We studied that last week. But we are talking about when Titus now here came in 70 AD and destroyed the second temple. We're made to understand that many bronze, Alkabulan, black Negroes, Yehudis, Israelites, Judeans left Israel and they migrated to Africa, to West Africa. That's between 66 and 70 AD. In fact, R.L. Windsor puts it this way. It says, it is estimated that during the period of the Roman rule from Pompey to Julius, one million Hebrews fled into Africa, fleeing Roman persecution and slavery. Ella Hewley agrees that the 66 70 AD Roman Jewish War marked the peak of the persecution and the end of the original Hebrew Israelite as a nation. He says, Israelite who managed to escape their persecuted during the war subsequently migrated to West Alkabulan, to West Africa. I want us to get that, because in West Alkabulan, Judah is bordered by the Gold Coast, Ghana, to the West, Benin. And it's interesting, you know, only last week we were reading that Benin is now offering people of African descent, you know, the the privilege of coming back home. So there's Benin to the east and his situation with modern Togo. And so the whole thing has a very complex history because of the colonialization of England, France, Portugal, and so on and so forth. So what am I saying? I'm saying 
that the people who left Israel were none other than uh, the Al-Kibulan Israelites, uh, the Africans who went. And it was during that period, or subsequent, I should say, that they were picked up in West Africa and taken to the Americas and to the Europe and sold as slaves. So one can conclude, therefore, that the original slaves, many of them were Jews. They were Yehudis. Now, of course, for many people, they will find it hard to swallow. But I have followed the, 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 the trail of the scriptures in, in, in presenting that because we are told that the Europeans have designed various names. You know, they call it Fida, Hauda, Waida, Ahuda, the region ancient author called Judah. He said the biblical writer called it Yehudi, but the Europeans call it Waida, Ahuda, Fida, and Ida. Now, so we also read that there is evidence that that Judah was inhabited by the descendants of Jacob who subsequently deported during the transatlantic slave trade can be found written in the testimony of the testimony of Aloda Aquinano. He was captured at age 10 from the for former place in Africa we now call Biafra, just above the deserts of Seth. And this is what he, he writes, and I, I, I will show it to you, read it to you. He says, they have, talking about the bronze people, they have many offerings, particularly at full moons, generally two harvests before the fruits are taken out of the ground. And when any young animals are killed, sometimes they offer a part of them as sacrifice, these offerings, when the made by one of the heads of the family. So they're talking about the feast days here. And that's here in, included in his testimony. Now let's turn to Joel chapter 3 and verse 6. Joel chapter 3 and verse 6. And it says, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians. You sold them to the Europeans. Are you with me? That you might remove them far from their borders. This is Joel the prophet saying these same people, these same al and these same bronze Negroes that migrated from Israel to West Africa, they were sold to the Grecians, to the Europeans as slaves. Now, it's hard to refute these facts. And moreover, we are made to understand that which we now call the Atlantic Ocean was called the Ethiopian Ocean. That's what it was called previously. It was called the Ethiopian Ocean. And then the cartographers change the name and the politician change the name and call it the Atlantic Ocean. But it doesn't take any great scholar to go back into history and see that, it, you know, it was called the Ethiopian Ocean. And so they traveled across the Atlantic to the Americas. And so that's why when you go to places like New Mexico and elsewhere, you see stones and artifacts written in Hebrew, written, of course, by the slaves who came here from these lands. So let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 16 and 14 to 16, and the word says, Therefore, behold, the days come, Saint Yahweh, 
that it shall no more be said, the master liveth. No. That brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He said, that was in the former days. But the master liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he had driven them, and I will bring them again in their land, and I, I gave unto their fathers. The land I gave unto their fathers, I will bring them back. Behold, I will send for many fishers, say Yahweh, and shall fish them, and after will I send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rock. Now, it is interesting because as we touched upon earlier, the fact that the possibility exists that the majority of the people there, perhaps with the exception of the Falashian Jews from Ethiopia, very few of those people are originals. They are not altogether natives of the land. They were brought there. The word tells us that. And so we don't have to conjecture. It says that. So we may find that many of the people who are fighting are fighting for a land that doesn't belong to them. And so Jeremiah is telling us that there is going to be a second exodus. Not necessarily a physical exodus, but an exodus based on what Baruch chapter 2 and verse 30 is saying. Baruch, as you know, was the scribe, the secretary of Jeremiah. And he says, in the last day, in the days now, the same people, the Alkabulans, the children of Israel, they are going to know themselves and they're going to realize who they really are. That's what's going to happen. And I think that is playing out even now as we speak. It's coming together. Now, how did they get into slavery? Now, that's easily understood now. And having looked at the history, because when we read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 68, we read this. And Yah shall bring thee into Egypt. Egypt here means bondage. Again with ships. By the way whereof I spoke unto thee, thou shalt see no more again, and there ye shall be sold as enemy for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So the question is this, based on the word of Yah, the question must be asked and answered correctly. Which group of people, which other people group in history, were sold to the Greeks, to the Europeans, and brought to the Americas and to Brazil and to Britain in ships. Well, we know the history because even John Newton wrote, even as we sing, Amazing Grace. And I've long since said, perhaps he could have named that Amazing Race even though there is just one race of people. But the point is that the facts are coming together with such force that the game says, and those who have hidden the truth for so many years, they cannot now hold it back because Yah is saying, I'm going to correct the quantum of all the inexactitudes that have been allowed in history to taunt my people. And that's why we have to now look at the man Zephaniah. Zephaniah 3, let's go there. Zephaniah, and Zephaniah tells us what? Well, you know, it is interesting that let's let's I'm gonna do chapter three, but I want to do chapter one to remind you who Zephaniah is. Zephaniah, as you know, is a contemporary of Josiah and of Jeremiah. It's in that era, and he's, he gives us like a, a family tree, a, a, you know, of, of 
five generations. Listen to him. The word of Yahweh which came to Zephaniah, that's Sophanus, um, the son of Cushi. He's a what? He's a son of Cushi. Mean, he's a black man. He's a bronzy. The son of Gedaliah. Remember, Gedaliah, after the children of Judah were taken away into captivity, Gedaliah was the governor of Judah. Hear me? And Zephaniah is letting you know he's related to, Ged to Gedaliah, who was a black man and who was governor of Judah. So it's not too difficult to go into the word and to look at your own family and you being descendant of them. You have the right, the scripture right, to say you're a Jew without any, you know, thought of doing it in fear of anyone might get angry. Yeah, it gives you the authority. So he said, I am the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Ezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. And so he traces his lineage all the way to King Ezekiah, which means it's part of the line of David, King David. He's part of the line of King David. And of course, we understand in 1 Kings chapter 10, when the Queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia and went to Solomon, and we are made to understand through the Kiba Negros that they had a son called Melech, and then we started that Davidic dynasty of which Alice Celeste became the 225th descendants of that dynasty. It's there, it's rich. And if we ever were to go to Second Chronicles chapter 35, we see there where Josiah was begging the priest to bring the harp back into the temple. It wasn't there. It was taken to North Africa, Elephantine Island in Egypt, and was taken to, later on, it was taken to Tanya, Kirkus Island, and then to Aksum in Ethiopia. And so now we're ready for chapter 3 of Zephaniah, Safan. And we're going to read verse 9 and 10 just to consolidate the points that we have come together, bring together this night. For then will I turn the people a pure language, as Hebrew, that they may all call upon the name of Yahweh to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. From what? Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. That's where the people are. My suppliants. Even the daughter of my dispersed. He said my dispersed people are down there beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And they shall bring me my offering. What offering? They shall bring their heart back to him. So that's a brief little history of what happened during that particular time and what we're now seeing playing out in Israel is really a story that we need to take closer look at because people are prone to deceive us if we are not careful. They, they, they will do that. So we see that after the Assyrians took our people away to Africa, they repeopled the people, the place, with people who are not natives there. And I've been there since. And so when I hear politicians and others are saying, this is people group and this is people group, all we have to do is to go back to the word and see what Yah says. It says, Sephardim, one of the cities from which the king of Assyria brought settlers to Samar Samaria after the conquest of the kingdom of Israel, as we read in 2 Kings 17, 24, Sephardim is also mentioned among the cities. It's there. As King Sennacherib of Assyria boasts, he brought the people there. And so 
we have to understand what is happening. Josephus states, as a fact, he said, the, the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates River till now. This is a Hebrew historian. He says they're there and are immense multitude and not to be estimated in numbers. So we need to understand that and realize that many of that which politicians and others are telling us, it bears no resemblance to the scripture, none at all. And so we have to go back into scripture and see where the people were placed. Syria, as I indicated earlier, was located in the northern part of Mesopotamia, which corresponds to most part of modern day Iraq today, as well as part of Iran, Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey. That's where they were, they were, they were brought. The Bible says that's where they were brought. The prophets wrote, the apostles wrote that. But the politicians of Europe and elsewhere said, no, they're from Europe. So they brought some people. Let, let me say that another way. Just like the Assyrian king brought people that were not natives to Israel, that's exactly what the British had done today and has left the world in a state of ambivalence because nobody knew who is who. Because of interbreeding and all that, we can't preclude that. And so the only thing we can go by is that the true Israel of Yah, according to Galatians, let's, let's, let's go down to Galatians, down here in the Testament made new, and we will read Chapter 3 and verse 17, he said, And this I say that the covenant that which was confirmed before of Yahweh in his Messiah, that's the Levitical law, which came 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make a promise of none effect. The, covenant that he made with Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis cannot be annulled by the Levitical laws, the book of the law, whereas the covenant is based on the book of the covenant. And in verse 29, he says, and if you be the Messiah, then are ye Abraham's seed, and he is according to the promise. So what's my point? My point is, regardless of the many people groups, people religious, saying that they're Jews and saying that they're Israelites, the Israelites of Yah, according to Galatians 6 and verse 16, it says, and as many as walked according to the rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of Yahweh. That's the Israel of Yahweh. So you're, you're not an Israelite because you're born in Israel. Are you with me? You are an Israelite because you've accepted Yeshua and you're obedient to him and you're under covenant with him. You have a covenant relationship with him. Only then might you be able to say, Abraham is your father. It's not the old covenant. It is the new covenant. It's no longer on tablets of stone. It's in our hearts. I will make a covenant with Judah, and I will make a covenant with Israel. And I will put my laws where? in the innermost part of their hearts. That's what the word said. That is the Israel of Yah. We've got to understand that. 
Otherwise, we will be confused by people who are claiming to be Israel. Paul, who says that he is the creme de la creme. Paul says, I am from the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew among Hebrews. He says that. But he says, he who is a Jew outwardly, the same is not a Jew. Nicodemus understood that. You cannot enter into the kingdom of Yah by way of birth, but only by way of rebirth, born again. And so perhaps the United Nations needs to understand this. The nations of the world need to understand it, that Israel is not a physical birth anymore. It is a rebirth. If you're born once, you're going to die twice. But if you're born twice, perhaps you may even only die once. Because there will be people alive when Yeshua comes. So we need just to look at that and understand that. And that's the essence of our study this evening, just to take a brief look at what is happening in the world and how the nations are now coming together and attempting to cut up the nation of Israel and how different groups occupying it. And yes, the land is mine. It's where my throne is going to be on Mount Olive. It's going to be on Mount Zion. So he told the first Israelite, try about the seven nations when you get there. So it seemed to me that the land has to be cleared. And whatever means, yes, he is fit to use it, he will. And we, we ought not to forget that when he wanted the children of Israel out, he brought in the Assyrians. When he wanted Judah out, he brought in the Babylonians. So who are we to say that if he wants the land to clear up now to accommodate those who he's going to bring into the land of Israel, the true Israelites who accept the Messiah as their personal Savior, it is not by physical birth again. It is by rebirth in Yeshua. And that's why when the woman asked at the well, the Samaritan, perhaps, as I indicated, a descendant of those people, the Assyrian king brought in. Where do we worship? He says, woman, you don't know what, you, what you're asking. Salvation comes to the Jews first. Let me say that again. Salvation came to the Alkibulin first. These are the Alkabulans who migrated to Africa. And perhaps you need to understand also, despite the fact what they taught us in their school, that all bronze people, all black people are descendants of Ham. No. The Negro Shemites, they are not Hamitic people. They are Shemitic people. And so we have to make that distinction. And it is the many Shemitic Negroes who migrated from Israel, which is their homeland, to West Africa. And it is from there they brought them to the Americas. And this is why we're having the problems today. So the, the problem is this. If what we're saying here and what we're reading in the Word and interpreting it, correctly, if the hermeneutics are correct, then we must conclude that both Britain and America and elsewhere, they had held the dispersed people, the bronze people, Israel, in slavery. And you know, if that happens to Yad dispersed people, he is not going to let it rest before he holds those people accountable. He will. He held the Assyrians accountable. He held the Babylonians accountable. 
And he said, my people who are called by my name. And, and so my encouragement this night is, is to awaken our people so that they will call upon him. He said, if my people, in Chronicles, you know, 740, if my people who are called upon my name shall what? Mm -hmm. Shall humble themselves and call upon me, what will happen? Well, let's read it. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, what's his name? Yahweh, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So we can conclude that slavery for many of our ancestors was really a chastising rod used by Yah, as he's done in the past, to bring us back to him. And that's why he brought us on ships here and brought us on ships across the Atlantic to Bristol and Liverpool and other places, to Brazil and so on and so forth. So now, having understood who we are as a people, we must humble ourselves and call upon him. He said, and I will forgive your sin and heal the land that he gave us. We need to understand that. So I hope we, this little study drives us back to our own personal study of the word and see what Yah has in store to reveal to you. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen.